for coming onto the show. Uh, again, once again, just for the clarity, Robert, uh, Mr. Robert Cardena is running for the Congress on uh, in uh, Texas, on the 18th from the 18th district. He's on the ballot for the pri- Republican primary runoff and on July 14th. So we wish him all the, all the best on the day, and we'd like to know more about him. So, Mr. Robert Cardena, can you tell us more about yourself, please? Sure. Um, I'm a lifelong resident of District 18. Uh, I was born here in Houston back in 1975. I've lived a majority of all my life in District 18, except for about two years, uh, where we shortly, briefly moved to Laredo, Texas, for two years uh, of, and when I was in the middle, between middle school and, and elementary. Uh, we came back and pretty much been here um, all my life from that point. And uh, I have a uh, I'm married. I've been married for about 24 years now, and uh, we have four boys. They range from 19 years up to 23 years of age. And my my wife and I, we we are a believer of God. Um, we we attended church. We've uh, attended uh, various community um, volunteer programs in our church, as well as YMCA and. Uh, and right now I'm currently serving um, my community on a HOA level as well as a mud district level. And my wife uh, currently works for a nonprofit as well. So we're, we're pretty active in our community. Um, just like uh, many people, we try to try to be uh, uh, earlier in our years. We weren't able to do it. Our kids were young, like most families. Our, our priorities were with our young kids, um, getting them raised up and, and, and making sure that, that um, they're taken care of. And we got to we got to a point where uh, we both were able to do a little bit more in our communities, and that's where I'm at today. Uh, about uh, let's see, we're 2020, so about 2016, 2015, I decided to run and get on my HOA board, uh, and then also my mud district uh, board because I seen some issues going on in my community that I felt that if they're going to be addressed, uh, I need to address them. I do believe that if it's to, if it's to be, then it's up to me kind of um, thinking. And I can't wait around expecting somebody else to uh, fix the problems because I may be the one that, that may be the one that needs to fix the problems. I may have the solutions, um, although there are all, all types of solutions out there. Uh, if you care about something, if you're passionate about something, then I believe that you need to uh, move forward in, in pursuing to uh, try to find a solution and, and address those issues, rather if it's, if it's an issue that only affects you or an issue that might affect uh, a lot of people in the community, regardless of where you live. It's very nice uh, to know more about yourself. So so what made you to run? I mean, you, you've been serving your community and um, serving a couple of uh, uh, different boards. So what made you to run for Congress all of a sudden? Well, it wasn't something that was all of a sudden that I decided to do. Um, I, I have been looking at District 18 for uh, numerous years now. And before I got on my uh, MUD board and HOA board, I had uh, ran for commissioner's court for Precinct 4 um, back in 2012. Okay, um, and that, At the time, time uh, Commissioner Cagle was appointed. Uh, he had to run to uh, be officially elected as commissioner. And a lot of other candidates ran to try to get that that position as well. I felt that uh, I wanted to make a difference in my community in Precinct 4 overall and find better ways to provide a ser- a better service across the uh, Precinct 4 for residents in general. And it also gave me a- an idea of what I might be looking at long term. So long term. I knew that District 18 has been grossly underserved, and when I mean underserved, I mean by a representative um, for Congress for this district. We had a a representative, she's been in office uh, for, well, really 25 years now, and if you look at what she's accomplished, depending on who you talk to, they'll tell you that she's accomplished a lot, but if you look at the district overall as a whole and see the issues across the district and and when I say across the district, I'm talking about the individual communities in, in every point of the, uh, the district. You know, you talk to those individuals and, and, and if they're being real with you, you're going to find a lot of issues 
rather if it's you know uh, flooding issues, if it's road issues, if it's uh, social services issues, maybe security issues with um, police. Um, maybe it could be uh, uh, welfare issues, whatever that those issues might be on those individual communities. Some of the communities are going to be similar. We're, we're, we're going to have similar issues across the board, but individually, we're going to have slightly different issues that that need to be addressed. And and I felt that she has not addressed those issues, especially most recently, that has been come brought back to the media's attention with uh, arsenic and. Uh, uh, contamination issues on the east side of the district, where those those issues have been there for decades, and she's been in office for decades, and yet she's just now trying to address those issues. Uh, so I would say, wh where's she been for you know for the, for for all those decades, and why hasn't she addressed those issues? You know, you can you can blame it on somebody else, uh, uh, maybe a company, maybe another party or an individual, and saying that they we're keeping you from being able to prevent that, but she's the leader of this district. So as a leader, you have to take accountability yeah. and, you know, you have to take responsibility. If I'm the captain of the ship and if it, it, it sinks, well, that falls on me. And in this case, uh, I believe that uh, district 18 is in a sinking position. And I believe uh, she's responsible for that, that, that uh, position of it sinking at this point. And, and I don't think that uh, she is uh, representing or is she feeling her duties as a leader for Congress for District 18 um, to uh, to fill to fill the, the the needs that the residents are asking for and I'm not ask I'm not saying, talking about social programs um, I'm not one that that believes entirely of social programs although I do that do believe that they're helpful um, I just think that they uh, we need to make sure they're not being abused so they're there for other families when in need mm -hmm. um, but but as far as you know why specifically again it's I don't believe that she's uh, been serving the district I believe that at this point in time um, from my ex my personal experiences growing up uh, my uh, personal experiences as a business small business owner my experiences as an HOA director, my experiences as a, as a MUD director specifically, is allow is going to allow me to lead this district if elected, um, and to better serve every community. Uh, my goal is to, if elected, is to meet with every single community, to notate every specific issue that's in in the community, and to lay out a plan to specifically address those issues rather if it's local or if, if it requires legislation federal on the federal level, then let's, let's uh, find out what kind of legislation needs to be passed in order to address those problems. But um, I believe a large part of the issues can be addressed locally and, and on a local level. Gotcha. Thank you. I mean, we will certainly, I mean, we, we, got, we got some points on from you about the Sheila Jackson, so I'm um, the current Congresswoman in the Eastern District. Suddenly we'll come back to those points a minute yet towards the middle of the program. Uh, before we get into the uh, uh, her topics, can we talk about the COVID-19 and the, uh, the uh, impact of the COVID-19, especially in the Texas and Houston area? How both the federal and the state level, the local level governments handle this COVID-19 pandemic in your area and national level? Okay. Well, on the local level, uh, I think, you know, everybody's just trying to make a decision regardless of what side of the aisle you're on. Uh, there's going to be critics, no matter, no matter what decision you make. And uh, every, every leader is just trying to make the best decision that they can, that they believe is the best for our communities. Um, aside from that, I have my own opinions and what I believe that uh, could have been done and should have been done. And, and, and what I believe is that I think that the closure of all businesses were unnecessary. I do believe that we do need to keep everybody safe and make sure that there's policies and procedures in place to make sure that um, every, every resident is safe, especially when they're going to businesses. And they're just now starting to implement that. And I believe that instead of shutting down the, uh, the economy, I believe that they should, what they should have done is met with all businesses establish a policy and protocols and procedures on how to keep the businesses open and allow the economy to stay open 
and and, res, and uh, the community to stay safe. And, and they're just now starting to implement that, which is, you know, the businesses uh, should and should require um, to keep their customers as well as their employee staff safe. So if they need to wear masks, um, then wear masks. Um, they got to keep uh, their environment, their, their, their uh, businesses operations clean. And then when, uh, when uh, customers come in, they should wear their masks, protect, uh, protect the, uh, themselves from other customers, as well as uh, protect the, uh, the employees and the establishment. The one thing I am against is that some, a few of the leaders have been telling uh, residents to wear any mask. Um, well, I, I get the understanding is that putting something over your face will prevent, if somebody's coughing, prevent that those droplets from being spreaded because they'll go into that mask. I get that. But um, you can't control the airflow, okay? So if your mask is loose, air can carry that droplet out of that mask. And I know that may be hard to believe, but that, that does happen out of that, that mask and it'll still, and I, and I hear the doctor saying, well, you need X amount of droplets to become ill. I, I don't agree with that. I think it's, I, I think that's a risky, uh, a risky uh, thing to say. And it's kind of like playing Russian roulette with somebody's life. Um, you know, uh, we don't control, uh, the air. We don't control where those molecules, uh, flo- uh, uh, spread or, or how they float through the air. And so, uh, you know, the mask that I, I would uh, recommend people to do is the, is the ones that they create a seal around your, and those are usually the N95s. Most of them are familiar with uh, the medical ones, but there's N95 plus, And those are the ones that I wear, I wear and use in my, my uh, business um, to protect me from uh, mold spores and air particles and things like that. There's also some that have uh, vent valves on them, which uh, I definitely would recommend because those uh, reduce the buildup of uh, carbon dioxide in the mask. Um, and it also allows them to breathe better, uh, especially because if those masks that don't have those vent valves get wet, it makes it very difficult for you to breathe. And I know that professionally um, because I have to deal with those kind of masks on a daily basis. But, you know, every family has to make a decision. Okay, you, me, um, our neighbors, we have to decide what's best for us. And ultimately, we need to leave that up to the families. But at the same time, my decision, what I decide for my family, cannot affect you, my neighbor, or, or my uh, fellow resident in any, any form. Because now my decision becomes your problem. If, if I, let's say I don't wear a mask and I walk down the street next to you and I'm coughing, I'm not near, nowhere near you, but you might, might come just within a few seconds in that area. I just adversely affected you and you don't even realize that and you may become ill and you don't even have an idea that it may be. So, you know, I get it. You know, I'm, I'm a constitutionalist. I get that, you know, people want to be able to make their own free choices and, and I support that. But at the same time, our choices cannot affect our neighbor's ability to make their free choices as well. And so I think as a nation with the constitution that, that promotes individualism. Um, it, it, is, it is a very high responsibility that we each have to have this, this ability to make free choice for ourselves, our lives, our families. But it, it, we need to understand that it's a, there's a higher level of responsibility than just making the choice to go to dinner tonight or owning a, a handgun or being able to decide where I'm going to work or live or move. I mean, there, there's a lot more uh, choices in that single choice that we're making. And, and people don't under, always understand that. And, and if we take the time to think about how much, how much impact is on that single choice that we make, how much impact we have on others on that same pay, that, that choice that we make, I think people would understand a little bit better. Um, but... It's it's a touchy subject, and right, right now I believe everybody is uh, making decisions based on a political uh, move, rather if it's best for their their uh, political career, or 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 is this a good idea to 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 promote my political agenda? In the end, we need just need to make what's the best decision that's for our families, for our community, and for our economy, especially because right now what I've seen. What I've been seeing and a lot of people have been seeing is you go to the businesses, I mean, it looks dead. It's a desert. And what I'm afraid of 
is that when we come out of this, we may not have any businesses left other than major corporations that have the money to stay afloat. And, and, and I don't think in the end, I don't think that's going to be good for our communities or our economy in the end. So, I mean, you're talking about health. Well, okay, we need to talk about our health, but we need to talk about health of our economy as well. Gotcha. So you have an economy, uh, but you mentioned that, I mean, if you keep the businesses open, we can keep the, at least businesses afloat, I mean, through this uh, pandemic. Mm, but say if you look at the uh, numbers, I mean, the states where they have been open, I mean, during the uh, beginning initial states of this uh, pandemic time, they are the ones who are getting more number of cases now. Let, us, let it be Texas or Florida, even California is also coming back again with the new cases. So, I mean, is it, I mean, uh, evident that, I mean, the, uh, keeping the uh, businesses closed, I mean, is helping the controlling the uh, spread of the virus? I mean, I'm, I'm not ed I mean, uh, advocating that we need to close a business. I know it's a big, very hard uh, decision yeah. to close a business. But, I mean, this, uh, the data says that I mean, if you're closed, I mean, the spread is low. Well, that's one way you can look at it. I mean, obviously, if, if the businesses are closed and nobody's going in and out, um, obviously, the, 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 the spread is going to be minimal or, or, or none at all. But at the same time, is, is that you're, all you're doing is, is slowing down the spread. You're not really preventing it. The, the, the virus is going to be still there. I mean, we still have the flu virus. Uh, you know, we, ha we have <laughs> the, the cold that spreads around every year, no matter what. I mean, it really doesn't pick and choose on when it's going to come and go. I mean, uh, there are certain seasons where the spread is less. It's not, it's not as dominant. Um, and in this case, so far, everybody thought that the, the, the virus, the coronavirus, is going to uh, slow down as the, as the temperature warms up. But that has not been proven the case. Um, it seems to be uh, still thriving and still moving as, 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 as just as strong. Now, um, it, it just, again, it goes back to, I guess, what kind of agenda somebody's pr trying to promote, you know? So, you know, if you're trying to prove the case uh, that the virus is deadly, then I think everybody's in agreement that the, the, the virus is deadly. I um, mean, it's going to be deadly. It might be more deadly to some and less deadly to others, depending on the health uh, 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 situation of, of your own health. But to sit there and say that some businesses, if businesses close altogether and nobody goes uh, to a business to shop or go to work and that it, it's going to uh, slow the spread or lessen the, the spread, they would be accurate in, in, to an extent. But what if they're, they're staying at home and, and they got to go to the store or they got to go to the gas station, they got to go to the doctor, wherever it may be, uh, they're still spreading it. And uh, we, we, the only way to prevent this from spreading and completely going down, uh, uh, in, increasing the, the spread is completely shutting the economy. Okay. And if you're going to do that, that should have been done months ago, 30 days, shut it down for 30 days. Um, but then you still have people that you don't know who has it, who's, who's coming in contact with it, and who's spreading it. I know they're doing testing. Um, they're trying to identify those individuals. But they're, everybody has the answer. Everybody thinks they have the answers. I'm not going to sit here and pretend I have the answers or the solutions or say that my, my ideas are the best way. I'm, I'm not going to do that. But what I do is evaluate what, what's going on, the information, and try to determine for myself what I think we should do versus what we shouldn't do. And I, I, I understand and I hear people saying, well, you know, we shouldn't keep the economy running just for the sake of keeping businesses open. Um, that's not what I'm saying. If at the end of the day, we close all businesses, we shut down the economy to keep everybody safe. Okay. And once we get to a level uh, where everybody agrees that it's it's safe, um, the spread is very minimal now, and then we reopen all again, okay? And then all of a sudden, the virus starts spreading again. We haven't really solved anything. All we've done is prevent it from spreading faster. We just slowed it down. But we're not resolving the problem, which is the virus, okay? So the only way to get rid of it or resolve the issue 
is come up with a vaccine or some type of treatment. Just like when we have a treatment for flu, we use influenza. So for the influenza, we use Tamiflu, right? And generally, when people get sick, they're going to be treated with Tamiflu. So what I think we need to focus on is a, some type of vaccine similar to Tamiflu um, for this coronavirus to, to help uh, control it. And it's just right now we're just trying to control it. We're really not preventing it. We're just we're just trying to control the spread. And, and you know, we're are we winning? Um, I, I would say yes. But depending on the numbers you look at, I would you might say no. So um, I, I will tell you this. One of my board directors recently uh, was a. Uh, diagnosed, well, actually tested positive coronavirus. Okay. So he's quarantined. He's been quarantined since last Monday. Mm-hmm. And, and so, you know, he's in his house and, and he, he, he can't do anything and he, he's having symptoms. He's not, he's having, you know, uh, runny nose, his achy pain, um, coughing, stuff like that. And at first we, we thought maybe it was just a flu. I mean, not flu, um, uh, allergies because he does have allergies and uh but when he finally got tested he tested positive um we just uh you know as a board we told him you know take care of yourself um stay at home and uh just keep us informed what's going on i mean i I want to keep business he knows my position he and you know and he's a democrat you know he, he votes democrat so you know and we we get along we have we have conversations you know even though we're different parties, we vote different parties. Um, we we're open minded. We we listen to each other's views and and we conversate. And sometimes we agree, sometimes we don't. That's just the way it is. But um, you know, and he's a he's a small business owner himself as well. So mm-hmm. and, and he he felt he felt um, unfairly targeted when he had to shut his uh, business down and he couldn't re- uh, open up until they told him. You know, because he has a livelihood, and so and, and he felt it unjustice, and and that and from a small business owner, you know, I I look at this, yeah, I want to keep my customers safe, and I want to keep uh, residents safe, but at the same time, um, it hurts me to see that small businesses in business in general um, are struggling, that uh, that they're just trying to stay afloat, that that's just paying the bills and keeping keeping them there, but ultimately. Is, is that going to, is that going to carry them over after all this? Are they going to, after all this is over, are they going to be able to stay in business? Are they going to continue? Are they going to have to shut down? We just don't know that. And, and, and anybody that, I don't think anybody can answer that right now, but looking at, at the facts, I want to say is that I'm going to say is a lot of businesses are going to just end up closing doors and, and just disappearing. Uh, it, that's just looking at the numbers and looking at the facts and, 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 and then, and then the, the consumers after all this is over is going to be wondering what happened to all these businesses. Well, the coronavirus is what happened. I agree. I agree. I mean, the small businesses uh, is the one which is going to suffer a lot and it's been self-employed and the small business owners, I mean, are going to go through this lot of pain, uh, especially, I mean, uh, running the business and also taking their own family and their own lives. I mean, yeah, we have to see how they could recover and recover, and uh, uh, probably they, we may find new ways to revive the economy, revive their businesses. Uh, ho- uh, let's hope for that. Uh, and uh, I know the PPP it, uh, has helped a little bit, but I don't know how much, how long it can take it. So we we will let's hope and pray things will get back to some normal uh, a normalcy in the lives of the small business owners. Coming back, going switching the topic from this COVID-19, uh, to the uh, which is related to the COVID-19 and also the uh, regular life of healthcare is another thing, issue uh, in our country. Uh, it's been there for more than two decades and we've been talking about high cost of health insurance and uh, mm-hmm. uh, not everybody has access to the health insurance. And on the other side is the affordable, as we discussed about the affordability is going down. I mean, yeah, so not everybody is able to buy the health insurance or, I mean, cost, because cost of living is also very high, I mean, let it be housing or anything. Right now, with the affordability uh, is low. Uh, so many people are, that's the reason, I mean, the Green Party movement and the Bernie Sanders movement has picked up. I mean, that's where everybody wants something free. 
uh, healthcare, mm-hmm. I mean, uh, are a slow paying healthcare system and free college education. So those are the uh, uh, main agendas of those parties. So what do you say? I mean, Republican Party is uh, uh, stand is a little different on this, top, this topic. So what is your view on healthcare and reviving healthcare? This is the hot topic of the people in the country. Well, I, I do have a very passionate position on healthcare. It's, that's something that I have been looking at for probably about ten years now. Um, okay. Well before Obama, before Obama became uh, president, and you know, I've looked at, uh, I've uh, watched different documentaries, uh, looked at the different information that those documentaries, and they were comparing different countries and and the different health cares from those those different countries, and the vast majority of them were social program type health cares where the government essentially was paying for it. But the one thing that they did point out is all those countries uh, were going into bankruptcy. They were going into se- uh, severe debt because of the health care system and, and, and the, the way it was designed to pretty much uh, 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 pay for the, uh, the, the individual and the uh, citizen. The thing, the, the thing is, is that people didn't realize is that the people were not getting free health care they were paying for the health care through taxes, okay? So the higher the higher the taxes you have, the better health care you have. In some cases, there was a panel in a few of those countries where people, uh, a panel would decide on what, what kind of health care you would get or if you were going to get that service at all, depending on your age and your health condition. And, uh, and I think that's a, a big concern here in this country is if we go to um, government-paid health care, Will there be panels determine are uh, you going to get the service or no? Um, it's not worth spending the money on you. We're uh, you're gonna we're gonna give you uh, 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 what it would essentially be called hospice care. So they they give you medicine to make you com- comfortable, and and you just pretty much wait until you until you die. So, so a lot of people are concerned with that. My what I've been looking at is that I do believe in a free market healthcare. But what I I've seen the what I've observed to be the problem is the insurance industry, the pharmaceutical industry, the um, emergency service industry, the billing and coding industry, the uh, hospital um, system industry. All those factors are the problem. If you go into any store, even a lawyer's office. Uh, mechanic shop, whatever, um, you can get a price, you can get a cost on what it's going to cost you to get a specific type of service. There's no reason why you, me, or anybody shouldn't be able to go to a doctor's or a hospital, um, a pharmacy, whatever. And, ph- and pharmacies, generally, you can go up to a pharmacy and, and you can ask them what the cost of this medicine, they're going to be able to tell you that. Um, but we should know up front what we're paying, Right. That, that's first and foremost. Second is why why is it costing so much for a let's say a hernia surgery? Okay, and you can go to a different state or a different city for that matter, and the price will vary. The price will vary, and a lot of that has to do with economics. I understand that, um, and I've had I've had family members that've gone to different countries to get that same kind of surgery cost about five thousand dollars and here in the states it ranged anywhere from fifteen thousand up to and i've heard is up as thirty thousand i believe it, it in some cases in some states it might be higher than that for a hernia surgery sim- a simple hernia surgery um and, and we're not talking about heart surgery <laughs> or brain surgery of course that's hundreds of thousands of dollars so wh- what i promote what what i'm promoting on my platform the idea of a free market uh, medical industry where it forces the industry as a whole to compete for our service or our our our, our, tax, our our dollars as a customer sorry so if you and i we go to if you go to walmart or or, or kroger's or best buy wherever you shop okay and you don't like the price there well you're going to go online or you're going to go to another store and shop shop com- compare right and I think that we need to develop a healthcare system that does this exact same thing, um, that it forces the insurance companies, it forces the doctors, it forces the hospitals, it forces pharmaceutical to compete for our dollars. So 
they know that this guy over here has, let's say, influent, uh, uh, not, Tamiflu for $48, and this guy over here has it for $112. Well, who do you think is going to win? The, the customer is going to go over here with, for the guy that has it for $48, okay? And so we, we need to take that concept and implement it into the healthcare system instead of putting it, say, let's give free medicine, free health care to everybody, because the idea sounds great. Everybody wants free stuff. Um, but how long will that last? Realistically, somebody's got to pay for it. And, and let's be real. We're not getting it free. We're actually paying taxes to pay for it. So that's the illusion that people have. We, we're, we're, we're being fooled the, to the idea that we're actually getting something for free when we're really not. We're paying for it in tax dollars. Because and unless another country on earth is going to pay for our health care, we as Americans have to pay for it. So the idea of free, and it goes the same as, as uh, tuition. Yeah. If, I, if I go and borrow money. Yeah, I'll just stop you. One, so one question I'm here. When you talk about the taxes, I agree with you. I mean, nothing is free in this world. I mean, somebody has to pay the bill. Mm, so the taxes are the ones which are coming up. I mean, I... But when you come to the social safety net point of view, uh, see somebody may be disabled for some time, and somebody may lose their job for some time, they don't have a revenue. Uh, I mean, for those kind of people, I know, I mean, for those kind of people, they may be looking for some safety nets. But at the same time, when you create a safety net, the other challenge is, I mean, some people will abuse it. I mean, they would like to uh, stay on the uh, safety net for a long time and uh, be lazy and they don't work and don't pay the taxes. So we see we have both the things. It's a catch-20 situation, I know. So, so, but I mean, what are the, what is the solution for the people genuinely who are out of job and uh, who are disabled or who are not able to, in the free market, they still they have to buy their own insurance and uh, they will not, if they don't have a job, they don't have money, they will not have insurance. Is that right? Yeah, that, that's that's accurate. And like I said, um, I'm not going to sit here and pretend that I have all the solutions. But let me let me start with as growing growing up, um, I grew up on on the welfare. OK, my uh, my dad uh, at one point in his life, ha he, he made good money um, in the 80s. The bottom fell out. Everybody suffered. He lost his job. Uh, we were on welfare for a period of time. But one thing my dad always said is that this is just temporary. We're not to live on it permanently for the rest of our lives. Once we get back on our feet, it needs to be there for the, for the next family that needs it. And, and, and I do believe we don't, I'm not supporting the idea of eliminating welfare or social programs altogether. What I am supporting is the idea of making sure we have a system in place that allows families to pay for their health care at a reasonable price, affordable price. But for those that are out of work, uh, have health conditions that don't allow them to work, whatever those reasons may be, and they're legitimate, they've been vetted, they've been verified, that we have a social program in place like we did, like we do, but it's not being abused, and it'll, it gives them an avenue to get health care that they can no that they can no longer afford or otherwise would not be able to afford, and you know we're a nation we're a nation that that loves to give to 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 give charity, and I'm not telling my neighbors that you have to do it. I want you to come to your own conclusion that you're willing to help your fellow neighbor, especially those that that believe, you know, rather if you, you know whatever whatever faith you believe in, you know. If they believe in charity and they believe in helping their fellow uh, individual, then th I know those individuals will be more willing to give than ever um, if they're not forced and told that they have to. Every everybody loves to give. Everybody loves to help their their neighbor. But what they don't like is being forced to, being told they have to. And you're taking their choice from them, saying you don't have a choice. You don't have a right to make that, that decision when that is completely wrong. So when you give them and allow them to make that choice for themselves, they're more willing and more freely going to give and going to help and don't have a problem with that. That's not the, that I don't think that's ever been the issue is is helping 
families and, and individuals that need the help. It's the it's the fact the issue is the fact is that government and you have you have leaders telling people that we're going to take your ability your right away from you to make what's uh, what you think is best for yourself and we're going to make that decision for you for your health care and we're going to give all these other people free health care and we're not asking your permission okay that that's what essentially what they're telling telling you they may not say it directly in that in the in those words but that's essentially what they're saying and and I don't think that's right. But again, I'm not supporting the idea of saying, oh, well, these people here can't afford it. They they got to do deal without it. No, no. I, I think that from a from a Christian perspective, I think that's completely wrong. Um, but from an individual uh, uh, perspective, even if, let's say even if I wasn't Christian, just my just my values alone would not allow me to support that kind of thinking. And I do know that there is individuals out there that, that believe that way. I don't support those individuals, nor would I agree with them. Um, but that, that, that's, that's where my position is. I, I'm, I'm more looking for solutions that are going to resolve the problems, but at the same time uh, uh, support the idea um, of what the Constitution stands for. Gotcha. Okay, thank you very much for your uh, views on this particular topic. Sorry, I interrupted you on the education. I mean, do you no, want no to go problem. to education? No. Yeah, if you want to say, uh, talk about yeah. education, please go ahead and say the views on the education and uh, uh, sure. the tuition fees. I mean, we were talking about the college tuition fees. Or, uh, yeah, please go ahead. Okay, that's where I mean the yeah. other the Green Party and the Bernie Sanders party, free tuition uh, for the college and all those things because they are affordability because it's becoming a big toll on the students. Once they come out of the college, I mean, they have a big, a huge, uh, huge debt on their head and they have to work hard to pay them back and then have to leave their general life. So it's becoming a little harder and harder for the younger generation to uh, cope up in the life. So yeah, please yeah, share your views on that one. Okay. So with the college, um, I, I have uh, student debt myself. I'm still paying that off. And, you know, I didn't uh, go in there expecting somebody to pay for my college. I, I actually didn't even expect my dad to pay for my own college. If I, if I was going to go to uh, get a little more education, it was my choice. Um, I think some uh, kids nowadays, they feel entitled that their parents should pay for their, for their education. You know, Again, that goes back to the individual family. They've got to make their own choices. Um, parents want to pay for their, their kids' college. That's their, their choice. None of my business. That's their choice. Um, but when, as a student, if I'm going to get a loan from the federal government and, and uh, decide to go, rather if it's get a, a law degree or get a, uh, a, a, a doctor's degree, whatever that degree may be in, in arts, whatever it may be, um, that's my decision. Okay. So now I got to look at what the cost of that degree is going to cost. And today, a lot of these degrees, the cost is, is, is just completely out of reach for a lot of students that want to seek those degrees. And if they do decide to go, as you said, they're going to be severely in debt and they're going to have to work it off. And the reality is, is it's going to be years before they get to that, that plateau to where they can afford to pay it um, because they may go years before they uh, will be able to pay it. They won't be able to pay it for years before they get to that point that they can pay it. And and that was that was the case for me. And and my wife, she she has a uh, school debt as well, and she works for a nonprofit, so she's she doesn't uh, make enough um, to pay for it. And I know some people out there are going to say, well, that's your decision, that's your your wife's decision. Um, that, that's true, but money doesn't drive me. The money is not my my driver. It's family. It's community. Um, that was what drives me. Money just pays the bills and and allows you to go and uh, to vacation and and wherever you where you whatever you decide to do with your money. But on my approach for the education, it, it's similar to the healthcare approach. The the you look at the the universities, rather right, major universities, wherever uh, uh, private universities. A lot of them look at how much they're paying uh, their staff. Uh, the professors, um, some, some, a lot of the, the staff, you know, they're making millions of dollars and they, they justify it because, well, this individual brings in these donors or brings in these people. Um, okay. Well, a lot of these universities are getting money from the federal government. Um, so 
the way I look at it is that they they need to lower how much they pay. You know, I don't have a problem with somebody being able to make the money that they want to make and they decide, but that's on an individual. If you have your own business, guess what? You, do, you get to decide how much money you can make and the customer determines if they want to do business with you. And, and in this case, um, they're, the, the, the board and some universities are deciding, well, this is how much we're going to pay and we'll recover this from our donors or by charging higher tuition um, from students that come, especially for those that come from out of state um, that are not local. So they, they get to charge that. Um, I don't, I don't think uh, offering to, uh, free tuition is the solution because you may have a student that is driven that will complete the, the uh, degree program and, and, and graduate. But then you may have a student that may not be driven, um, that struggles. And they're going to look at this, well, you know what, I'm going to quit. Not my money. So they're they're not going to appreciate the fact the the fact that the money was given to them to complete an education to help themselves versus somebody if I pay out of pocket for myself well I'm going to work harder to make sure I pass and and, and graduate because I'm spending my own money um, I don't want to waste my money and it's the same thing my son my oldest son he tended he tended one year of college because uh, he wanted to become a law uh, enforcement officer, but he was struggling, right? He was struggling. And uh, I told him, look, if you're not making the grades, you need to make a decision. Either you're going to, you're going to take more time to study, um, to, uh, to, to spend more time in, in, in studying and learning. And if you have to get more tutoring or, or whatever, then you need to take them more time and do that. But if, if you can't, then you need to decide if you're going to continue in college because you're really just wasting money. And it's not your money you're wasting because you're not paying for it. You're, get, you're either getting a grant or you're getting a loan. And that's not right because other people could, uh, other students could use that grant money, right? And I think as parents, as students, we need to be honest with ourselves. Um, we need to, you know, sometimes being a year from, before you go directly into college, if you, unless you know for sure that you're going to get a specific degree and this is what you want, then I would say, yeah, go to college, get it done. But if you're not sure, I think uh, uh, people need to take time a year off, really think about what they want, maybe go and serve, maybe work and think a little to figure out what they really want to pursue. Um, and before they go and seek that education, because just because and I think the problem is with our society is that we pushed for decades that you need to go to college. You need to go to college. And college is not for everybody. College is it's really not. Uh, there, there's vocational programs out there that uh, that might be right for better for some people. Um, and a, a lot of people might look down on vocational programs, you know, but those those People can make good money at it. If, if you're obsessed with money and, and you want to make money, you can make good money at some of those. But today's society is everybody wants to make millions of dollars right out of the gate. They, they want to be the next millionaire. And reality is, is that there's only so many people that are going to be the next millionaire and so many people that are only going to be uh, making $100,000 a year and so many people that are going to make maybe only $75,000 a year. Um, it is it realistic for everybody to be millionaires? I don't think so. Um, me personally, I don't desire to be a millionaire. Um, I'm, I'm a simple guy. You know, uh, I just, you know, if you put me in a, in a log cabin in the middle of the woods, I'll be happy, you know, but if you want to, or my neighbor wants to be a millionaire and they want to travel the world, all the power to them. I'm not going to hold you back. That's great. You know, it, it comes back to individual freedoms and, and I think this world is, is a better place because we have more individual freedom today than we ever had in the, in the last thousand years. Um, and, 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 and it shows that. But we edu education, it's hard to it's hard to def it's hard to fight the idea of free education because it's free education. Who wouldn't take free education? Um, to be honest. And nobody, no, if you're honest with yourself, everybody's going to take free education. 
but I cannot honestly sit here and and tell voters, uh, families that I support the idea of free education, knowing that at the end, at some point, it's going to be more costly to give free education than it would be for us to devise a system that reduces the cost of education to make it more affordable for families and individuals to go and achieve the education they desire. Gotcha. That's a very good uh, view on uh, uh, the tuition fee. But I mean, again, coming back to say again, social safety net issue, I mean, similar to that. See, m middle class and higher middle class and the rich people, they have some means to reach to the uh, college. But I mean, some people, I mean, who are at the lower level of the economic uh, lines, I mean, they it is hard for them to even apply for the college. Mm -hmm. So the, for those kind of people who do, what kind of solutions do you see? The, the, unfortunately, the, things, the system, these these things will come, I mean, uh, pop, pop up, I mean, because of uh, to help the uh, some people in the community. So, I mean, so, so what, what kind of solutions do you suggest for those people? I mean, I know it's not your responsibility, but as we talked about it, I mean, I'm just bringing it. I mean, if you have it, if you want to skip it to something else, we can go back to some other topic. As we discussed about it, I just brought it up. That's it. No problem. No problem. So I just want to clarify, when you say uh, people uh, that are struggling or having problems, they, they, they can't or struggling to to go to college, uh, what do you mean? I mean, what? see, there are some, there are people, I mean, who are, I'm sorry, uh, economically strong, but financially, I mean, back behind. So they will not be able to afford the tuition fee, fee and they will not be able to apply, dependently because they, if I go to this college, I know I can make it, but still, I mean, by the time I come to the college, I'll have 200K loan. So, I mean, I will not be able to, I mean, uh, have a decent life and then do this one. So, I will not be, I, I will better take some, as you said, occasional course or vocational course and then lead my life. So, I'm talking about from those kind of people. Yeah. So, I mean, it, it's, it's going gonna, it's gonna to take some time to develop a, a real solution for everybody. But some of the ideas that I was looking at, um, and, and we already have some businesses that already do th these things. And Chick-fil-A is one of them. Uh, Compaq, I, I worked at Compaq for six years uh, after graduating from high school. And they also had the same similar type of program in place. And there's other, pro other uh, companies that have similar programs in place. And, you know, you don't, you don't have to be a corporate level employee, but you can be just a, a bottom uh, level employee. And they offer, they offered the ability for you to go to school and they would pay depending on what it, it was that you were pursuing, they would either pay a, a percentage of that tuition or they would give you full, a, a full ride, right? Um, and then in exchange, you would just work for them for X amount of years, whatever that agreement would be, right? And, and this is one of the, the, the ideas that I was pursuing um, as far as for education, along with uh, vocational uh, training or companies providing a vocational training for their employees that want to further their career either with them um, for a short period of time and then move on, whatever it may be. And in this case, I, I think that companies in general can invest in their employees, um, their future, their education. This will help a lot of uh, individuals that can't afford to go and further their education uh, and, and in exchange that they would uh, devote themselves to that business or that company for an agreed upon time period, it, rather if it's you know a year, two years, four years, whatever that, uh, uh, depending on the education and what what it cost, what it would agree to. Um, you know, I remember my, growing up, my dad he worked for a a business, a company, and he worked in the oil business, and he worked there for thirty years, and and I'm like, and he he would have retired there if it wasn't for the eighties um, uh, fallout. But I look at that that time. And people worked for a company or business for decades. You know, they, they, they invested their self into that business. And the business also invested their, their resources into that employee. We're no longer like that as, as, as a country or, or globally. Um, we're no longer like that. Uh, it's, it's look at the employee as just a, a commodity, right? And we're just tossed away and replaced with another employer that they can pay employee that they can pay for a lot less money. And 
I think that if we start having a communication uh, between businesses, employees, to try to come back to a point to where we, they can invest in us, we can invest in them, and 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 spend money on education for their employees to to help grow themselves, but grow the you know, and and they'll in turn return will and it'll be an investment into the company because that employee will then come back and, and use that education that they, they acquired to help grow that company. And then once that, once that agreed upon time is, is done, they can decide to stay with that company or move on to another company if they so choose. Uh, but the, the, the other, one of the other factors, even with that idea is that the individual, we have individuals that would love that opportunity, that kind of idea, to love to pursue that. But then we'll have individuals that's like, uh, well, I don't want to do that kind of work. So they want to cherry pick, right? What what kind of work that they want to do? But then they want to make a lot of money immediately, and they, they and they need to make a livable wage because they got to pay their bills, and and that's just not realistic. Um, I know we hear a lot about. Uh, uh, we would normally would be considered part-time work, like make, work in McDonald's, Target, Walmart, whatever, increasing their wages. And, and, and in the last year or two, there, there was a man to increase the wage up to $15 an hour, whatnot. And you know, the only thing is those jobs were really designed for uh, college or high school level students to make some money, to pay some bills while they're going to school. They weren't designed to be to live on to to make a livable wage. If they were, there there would have already been a higher wage automatically. Um, so, if you work that kind of job, then you have to work multiple jobs, or you have multiple families make work in those jobs, and everybody contributes in the family to pay the, to be able to support the household. That's just that's just the way the process works. I'm not going to sit here and tell you that. That's the solution for everybody. It, it may not. There, there's scenarios that, that may not work for, for a family. And I'm just sitting here and saying is that everybody is on the bandwagon of free, free, free. And there is no free, free, free. It costs you something. You may not understand that it's going to cost you something right now, but it will cost you something. You're giving something. Rather, if you know it not now or later, you're giving up something, um, either in, in taxes, freedom, something you're going to pay for. It. And, and people need to understand that. And, and, and they're, they're, a lot of this is being driven by emotion. So we got emotion response politics is, is what we're, we're, everybody's being driven by right now. And, and, and we need to settle down. We need to take the time to think through these problems and come up with a long-term solution, not a temporary solution. These temporary solutions are are, are a large part of what the, uh, creating the problems that we have today. We need to we need to come up with long-term solutions. Gotcha. Thank you very much for your views on this topic. I know you brought in I mean few points like I mean the company should take care of their employees. I mean, but that's uh, again a little contradicting from the free market. Uh, uh, theory uh, in the beginning but yeah I don't want to get into that one right now we can take if you want to answer it that's fine else we can talk about it some other day we can move on well, let, me let, me, let me elaborate a little bit on that since you pointed it's because uh, I don't want you I don't want you I don't want to leave you thinking that I'm suggesting one thing when I'm and, and I'm and I'm yeah. saying yeah. Another. Well, yes. what, I'm, what I'm not what I'm not saying is that we we need to require businesses to do that what I would do if, if elected, I would have that conversation with companies, with businesses. I want to encourage them and explain to them and show them why this is beneficial for them as a business. As a whole, it helps the, uh, the community, it helps the individual, it helps the economy, and it helps their business as a whole. And, and, and go in, have that conversation, and explain why it's beneficial for them. Sometimes we only, we're only... Uh, looking in a tunnel, and, and this is all we see, right? Instead of opening our eyes and we see this whole spectrum uh, of, of possibilities. 
And I think we need to take those, those glasses off and look at the whole spectrum as a whole and see how what I do for this, this one little act will make a, a huge impact globally or economically or just in my economy, uh, in my local community is economy and how it has an impact on my business, how it benefits me. And ultimately all business owners, businesses always look at how does this decision impact my business? How does it impact my bottom line? Right? So that's the conversation you got to have. I, and any, any idea that I promote, I have my core values. Any idea, it may sound like that, oh, well, wait a minute, you, you, say, you say you believe this, but yet you're doing this. I am, I am never going to skew from my core values and what I stand for. I, 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 I stand firmly on the Constitution. Okay, Any legislation, any ideas that I promote, it starts with that Constitution of this, of this great country. Okay, I'm going to look at that Constitution. If, if, if it's a piece of legislation or if it's an idea, and if it does not promote any any amendment, any piece of that constitution, then I will not support that idea. Now, if I can come up, maybe change it to where it does, and it doesn't violate the constitution, the rights of the individual, then I will support that idea. But um, uh, other than that, no. no uh, but I'm not suggesting that businesses be required in, in, in no form at all. I'm not, not suggesting that at all. Got you. Thank you very much for clarifying that. And uh, another topic is hot topic today in the market is like in the Black Lives Matter moment. So, what's your view and uh, take on the Black Lives uh, Matter uh, moment in the US right now? Well, um, right now, I support anybody's ability to protest, but I don't support uh, people that want to riot vandalize kill and hurt people that's not protesting that is not protesting at all my if, if i'm going to use a a measuring stick or a gauge to know what is right and what is wrong um i use martin luther king martin luther king is one of uh, one of the individuals that i admire i admire since i was uh, in middle uh, elementary and he was able to accomplish a lot without violence he was, he was a man uh, of faith, and he promoted that. Um, it was well known. And if, you, if you're protesting in, in the way of Martin Luther King, I, ha I have no problem with that. Um, I believe he accomplished a lot in, in, his, in his lifetime. But what the current protesters are doing, uh, or in some cases they're rioters and they're vandals and looters, um, is, is destroying property, hurting and killing people in, in some cases. Um, it, it's not protesting. That, that's just an act of violence. And what happened to George Floyd um, shouldn't have happened. Okay, let, let, Let's start there. It shouldn't have happened. Um, it, what, it's, what the problem is, is not, and I know they, they, they're claiming racism. The problem is not racism. That, that incident had nothing to do with racism. Okay. That had to do with the policy issue within the police department. Rather, if the, 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 the police department wanted to admit it or not, I've seen that, that position that, that used on, uh, on other individuals, even in Houston, um, and it shouldn't be allowed. Now, if it, that knee was on his back, I don't think that would have been a problem. But to be on the neck or head of somebody, that's an issue. Um, and if somebody's crying out they can't breathe, then they should have simply just moved the, the knee to his back keep them pinned down. I understand they, ha they have to make sure that the uh, suspect is kept pinned down until they can properly secure him or her. Okay. But to have him pinned down by the throat, closing off his airway, that, that, is, that is something that shouldn't have happened. And that's, that's a poor policy, poor procedure, poor training. And that, that shouldn't have never happened. Um, I, I don't believe that to be a racist issue. It's on a policy issue. And I, I think that we have agitators, we have leaders that are using this situation to take advantage of it, for, to promote their own propaganda, and to promote the, that, the idea that, that racism is rampant. Is there racism still exists? Yes, there is. It's all across this world. And, and in some forms that people don't even realize. 
Um, but, and, you know, but to sit here and say that we are still in, uh, living in a world uh, 50 years ago um, is, is grossly, is, is grossly, grossly uh, misstated. And, and, and anybody saying, saying that we live in a world such as that today is completely wrong. It's completely wrong. Um, I, I've seen people that are these, especially these Black Lives Matter um, and these Antifa and, and there's another uh, individual, uh, Sean King, and then there's uh, the individual name, his uh, stage name's Killer Mike. Some of, some of the language and, and the statements they've made, based on, based on my understanding and, and, and what Martin Luther King stood for, the, the words and the, and, the, and the statements that they make are racism at their core. And, and, I, and I, I will call them out, and I, and I have called them out on social media, stating that these individuals are racist at their core, the very statements. It, they're sitting, talking about uh, white power, but yet they're out there ca calling for black power. That in itself is racism. Um, if they want to say white, somebody's saying white power is racism. Um, is it normal for you or me to be proud of our heritage? Um, I think I think it's normal for anybody, and and I encourage anybody to be proud of their heritage. You know, um, so depending on how you want to look at it, you know, what what if uh, you know somebody, you know, the I'm I'm let me go back and say I'm my dad is from Mexico, my mom is an American, so I'm half white, I'm I'm half uh, Mexican, but I wasn't raised up in an environment where we say you know you know. Uh, uh, Viva La Mexico or, you know, uh, white power or anything like that. I'm, I'm mixed. I'm a mixed race. Okay. And I'm proud of that. Okay. I, I have uh, a, a, a eye of diversity. I lens that I see different, different uh, race, different uh, ethnic groups, um, different opinions. And so it gives me an opportunity to see instead of from one point of view to see all points of view, but People are not going to like necessarily what I have to say because it's, it may not match with their narrative or their opinions. But it's, I think it's okay for every ethnic group to s be proud of their heritage um, and say, you know, yeah, we're Indians and celebrate y'all's heritage. Or, you know, Mexicans, uh, hey, you know, we're Mexican and we're proud to be Mexican. And, okay, and celebrate your heritage. And just like uh, Blacks. They can be proud that they're blacks and their heritage originated from Africa and whites. You know, they come from Europe, originated from Europe, wherever, whatever country uh, that, that in Europe they may originate from. I, I, I think we're so focused on the ethnic and where we originated from instead of looking at the core. OK, so if I come and say, well, you know, I'm better than you because I'm white, then we have a problem. Right. Um, but if I'm just simply stating that. You know, I'm proud to be a Mexican or proud to be white. That doesn't make me racist. It doesn't make me um, trying to be uh, better than you because you're black or you're, you're, you're Indian or, or because you're white or whatever it may be. Um, it just means that I'm proud of my heritage. OK, and if my heritage, a part of me is white, um, makes me racist or guilty because I'm white, I think that's just wrong. Yes, this country was founded, and when it was founded, there was slavery involved, okay? To be, you know, I think other, all countries around the world ha has been involved in some form of slavery. Slavery is not just, didn't exist just 200 years ago, 300 years ago. It's, it's been in existence for thousands of years, okay? And it didn't, it didn't involve just blacks, it involved whites, it involved uh, Indian, it involved uh, uh, Africans, it involved Turkish, it involved Russian, it involved Chinese, Japanese, it involved everybody. Everybody at some f and, and across the world was enslaved at some point. So to sit there and say that it's only happening to, to them, I think that's just grossly unjust and, and just wrong. But... Sometimes, and in this case, I think everybody's reacting emotionally, not not thinking with their heads, and they're just reacting emotionally. And 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 we have leaders and, and agitators that are taking advantage of that. They know that, and and they're abusing that, and and they're benefiting from that for their own gain. And 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 these uh, these uh, individuals don't realize that. They they don't, 
and I don't think they're taking the time to realize that. And, and we need to um, right now we're in a situation where we're destroying our country uh, or groups are destroying our country. And uh, we, we need to unify as a country and, and, and say this is enough. I, I get it. Yeah. Policy needs to change. But um, if we never if we never move past this racism um, card that's always being put out there, where racism will never disappear. It will never disappear until until we can start acknowledging that we're going to look at each other's character and judge each other based on our character, our actions that we do. Um, it, racism will never uh, be removed in, until that happens. And, and, and that's something that drives me because Martin Luther King, in one of his statements, let us be judged based on the content of our character. Okay, gotcha. not the color of our skin. Okay, and, and and I think that's true today more than ever. It's very very nice. I mean, uh, you have expressed your views on this particular topic. And nobody had said you brought in many other points, but we'll come back to you another day. We'll take another time and we'll discuss on those points later, little later time. Uh, coming back to the first uh, discussion, uh, first uh, points you have mentioned in the beginning, like Sheila Jackson's uh, uh, work and your district uh, see some people have been talking about the term limits and all those things but at the same time we have election system in the country usually that is supposed to check the uh, uh, performance of the um, elected uh, officer so in this case i mean sheila jackson has been uh, the uh, congresswoman for more than almost 25 years now and that means, I mean, she is doing good, looks like. I mean, that's why she's been getting elected every, I mean, uh, every time she's been contesting the elections. And at the same time, if you look at the polls and all those things, you are, you are, you are on the, uh, within the Republican Party, you are the second place right now. And you're running, uh, you're uh, running for the Republican nomination. So do you see a path for your election? Um, this district, I mean, whether ja Sheila Jackson has been there for 25 years and I and she has been uh, favored uh, in the in the particular district, and is, and I also read that I mean that district is mostly the democratic. Uh, the democratics are mostly favor in the democrat democratic party. With all these things, what, do you see a path to winning these elections? Uh, yes, I do. And if I didn't, I wouldn't. I wouldn't have uh, joined in. Uh, now, I didn't expect uh, so many candidates uh, in the primary. Um, I knew I knew there might be at least one or maybe two. Didn't expect to be six, but uh, you know I, I believe I was the last one uh, to sign and, and uh, submit my application uh, to be on the ballot. But some people might see that as I joined in at the last minute, but I really didn't. Um, I I took my time to think and 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 make sure that is this the right time for me to 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 uh, run. For this uh, for this seat, and and like I said, I I this is something I've been looking at for the last seven years, um, just observing, determining um, should I run, is it possible, and uh, when would be the right time, and you know, and ultimately I did decide yes I'm going I'm going to run uh, despite that the there was a x amount of people on the ballot for this position and and that there was numerous events happening. Uh, I wasn't running because it was going to be easy. I, I, I was not going to run because, you know, I thought, you know, it was going to be a shoe in. Uh, and I expect nothing less but a challenge. I think that's good for character. It builds your character. And if, if you don't have a challenge, I don't think that's good for, for the individual. Uh, challenges force you to be, to be better, become better. Now, Am I, uh, you know, the perfect candidate? No, I I'm probably not an ideal candidate for some individuals and I may be for others. I think everybody is looking for their perfect candidate. Reality is, is there's no perfect candidate. So you need to look at what that candidate is bringing to the table. What can they do? Are they gonna be able to uh, hopefully resolve some issues? And the worst case is that, you know, if the candidate doesn't, well, you can vote them out in, in two years, you know, but uh, and I, I'm not one that wants to sit in office forever. You know, if, if I was to be elected, I, 
I want to be there, do my job, and make sure the constituents are served much better than what they're being served now. And I want to make sure that there is another candidate that is uh, being uh, raised up to replace me if, if I was to uh, be in office for X amount of time. Because I want to make sure that there's somebody there that's going to serve uh, the district and the residents that uh, that deserve to be served properly. And, and right now, Sheila Jackson Lee says uh, in, every time she's in front of camera that she represents all the district equally and that she she cares about everybody. But if you look at her actions, and this is all I look at, I don't care about anything else. I'm looking at her actions, her actions, her statements say otherwise. She doesn't represent the district equally balanced. She only focuses on certain groups in the district. And, and that is true and it's accurate. Just if everybody goes look at that. Now, if you want to look at it as far as, yeah, she's been in office for 25 years or approaching 25 years. And everybody seems to think, well, she's been in office for 25 years. She must have been doing something right. And uh, we have these checks and balances, as you point out, and as I pointed out early on. Yes, that's true. But all you need is a percentage of the vote to get elected. So in District 18, excuse me, depending on the 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 numbers you you uh, look up from the census, uh, I found two different numbers. Someone someone ranging a little over seven hundred thousand, and another number a little over eight hundred thousand residents. We're just talking about residents in the district. Now, if you look at take that number and look at the eligible voters, you have somewhere between a little over five to almost seven hundred thousand, a uh, little over six hundred thousand uh, eligible voters, right? And of that number, you only you you have about a little over three hundred thousand registered voters, and we're not we're not talking about one party other, just total registered voters. Okay, and of that, in in the time that Sheila Jackson Lee has been in office, she has never crossed the threshold of receiving three hundred thousand votes every election cycle. She's never she never approached that threshold. Um, depending on the election cycle, she might get. Uh, Maybe I, I believe there, and I, I could be wrong, but I, I'm I'm trying to remember. But I believe it was like 286,000 thousand uh, uh, voters in one particular election cycle, and I believe that was during the uh, election with Barack Obama uh, during presidency. And but she's never crossed that threshold. So to depending on the numbers and the way you look at it, you might say, well, uh, she's popular. She's obviously winning the vote. Okay. So what you need to do is look at what vote is she winning? What percentage of that voting population is she winning? And yeah, it always says she's getting 75% or she's getting 80%. Yeah, but that's a percentage of only a small group of voters. Okay. So, so you got to look at it like that. So that means that she has, if she, if, let's just say for the argument, she, she got 298,000 votes every single time. And if we have 500 or we have 600,000 votes, let's say 600,000 votes for the sake of argument, so she gets 298. So that means I have two, I have two, per, uh, two voters that I, <laughs> I have to win in order to beat her. Um, that, means, that means that you, she has the other half that she's not uh, attracting or she's not getting. That means I have, to, I have to attract or win. And from my observation before I got into this, I looked at that. Those I looked at that. Okay, so she's getting a group of core voters, and it's only a small number of those core voters that she keeps every single time, depending on the election cycle and what's going on in the election cycle. Then she has there's voters that are just not going to vote for her, even if they're Democrat. They just don't like her because uh, of the way she her character is, or or her behavior, or her politics. They just don't like her, even though she's Democrat. Okay, and then you have independent voters, you have libertarian voters, and you, of course you have your Republican voters. Okay, so and but you also have swing vote Democrats. Okay, those are Democrats that will decide to vote one way or the other, depending on what's happening. So those are the voters that a a candidate has to go after, and, and has to be able to acquire those votes, and then. The other factor is, is that, like I said, is that 
if you're not the right candidate, if a voter feels that you're just not the right candidate, they're not going to show up and vote for you. They're not. So it's that simple. Just because you have an R next to your name or you have a D next to your name or an I or whatever, they're not going to vote for you just because you're on the ballot. You have to be able to get them to come out. And sometimes it may be, it may be what you say. It may be a platform that you're pushing on, on, on your, your campaign. It, it may be just the way you act or behave in front of the camera. You know, some people want a character. Somebody, you know, in the age of Hollywood, everybody wants somebody that's a star and they want to uh, act like this, uh, this uh, character on a, uh, on a, on a uh, uh, reality TV show. You know, uh, I'm just not that way. I, I wanna, I'm going to be real, but I'm not going to sit here and to pretend to be somebody that I'm not just to earn your vote. I'm going to earn each voter's vote because of what I believe, what I stand on, and what I'm trying to achieve. That, that, that's what I feel that uh, I can win. Um, and I, I'll point out the fact, my district, the, the mud district that I live in and that I represent, it's, it's Harris County Mud 150. Okay? The district is largely Democrat. It's a very diverse district. It has a little over 12,000 residents in the district. We have uh, 100 plus businesses. We have a uh, vast infrastructure that we have to take care of. We're responsible as a board. Okay. And, you know, it, we have a, it, it varies, but currently it's an $8.6 million budget. Okay. That we work with this, this current uh, fiscal cycle. And, and we have police, we have police contract services that we have to manage. We have trash services that we have to manage. We have, we have apartment complexes. We have uh, multiple neighborhoods. So we're, this district is, is much like a small city, town, or commissioner's precinct. And, so, and we're responsible for all the residents and making sure that we, we get, provide excellent service to the community. And if, if I'm comparing that to District 18, the majority of the district is Democrat. The majority of it. We're talking about 80, maybe 90% of the district Democrat. Okay? The rest of it is going to have some pockets of Republicans. OK, yet I'm serving this community, not because I'm a Republican or not because they know I'm a Republican or don't know I'm a Republican, but because they trust in the decisions that I'm making. That's why. I, and, and I've worked at that. I work to earn their trust. OK, I lay down what I'm trying to achieve. OK, when I when I was running to get on this board, on this mud board. OK, uh, one of the things the district didn't have is a website. That was one of my goals to accomplish a website got that website one of my goals is is to make the infrastructure and in, in better improve because um it just wasn't happening with the uh existing board um and and they were more concerned with making sure they didn't spend money well the whole idea for us as a mud board is to collect money to make sure the infrastructure is maintained and kept sound so we we can continue our services and and so I made sure to get other board members elected that have the same like-minded goal to make sure our district is maintained, taken care of, and that we're, we're serving our community, our residents well. And, and that's, what we, that's what I've accomplished. Um, and, and there's many other things that I'm trying to accomplish in our district to, to en enhance it, to make it better and, and, and bring uh, the quality of life uh, better in our district. And it's the same, same approach that I would do um, with District 18. And th this is why I compared my mud district to District 18, because it is a small form of, of District 18. It, it's in much, in much likeness of it and, and as far as the residents, the diversity um, in our district, uh, the, the, the infrastructure and the businesses, everything exists. Um, is there going to be people that don't agree with me? Yeah. In, in my district, there's people that don't agree with me. Um, but I lay, I lay out why why I believe it needs to be this way. They may not agree with it, but they understand. Um, and, and they can't argue with the results because um, it, it, it has improved quite a bit. Um, gotcha. So this is, this is something that I would you know, uh, compare and, and, and point out you know, why I believe that. It, and, and one of the main reasons why I decided to approve, I mean, to pursue this office is because I was able to accomplish and looked at this, is, is this viable? It's viable. I'm not going to sit there and tell you it's 80% viable, but it's viable. Um, if, if I can win the primary and 
if I can win the primary, then I will be focusing 100% on my goal to challenge Sheila Jackson Lee and point out to the residents, regardless of what party they're in, um, why I would be the best candidate to represent them and make and, and to bring this district in um, into the future. Gotcha. Thank you very much for your, uh, expressing your views and also other things, what you've done in your county or, or your board. Uh, so do you have any message to the audience or your constituents or your listeners yeah. right now? Sure, please. Uh, any, yeah, well, again, uh, my name is Robert Kadena. I'm a, run, I'm a candidate, Republican candidate for the uh, uh, Republican uh, primary runoff, and uh, I would like your vote and go to kadenaforcongress.com to learn more. You can also call me if you would love uh, to contact me personally at 713-258-0123. Um, you can email me uh, through my website. That's info at kadenaforcongress.com. And if you have any questions uh, or uh, uh, concerns or, or just want to know a little bit more about me, feel free to call me, email me. Um, but you can learn also a lot uh, more on my website as well. And I would appreciate and consider your vote uh, if you vote for me um, for uh, for this election. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Robert Cardena, for coming onto the show and uh, expressing your views and the thoughts uh, very honestly and openly. And we wish you all the best in your elections. Sure. All right. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Have a nice rest of the day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.